Yes, yeah. Mr. Roots. Yeah, respect me. How are you doing? Come in, come in. Thank nice you. to see you. You alright? Yeah. Good, Good to see you, man. Yes. Well, Levi, listen, thank you for coming along. Listen, everybody knows about Mr. Levi Roots, what you've done. Um, but I'd love to just start by just talking about your childhood and, and how it all began and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, Rio. It's been a pleasure to come and have a chat with you. Oh, cool. um, yeah, you mentioned about the childhood, which is a great place to start, you know, mm. take me way back then. I had a beautiful childhood, I, I really did, especially as a young child. I grew up in a place in Jamaica called Clarendon, which is one of the leafier parts of, of Jamaica in, in the 60s back then. Mm -hmm. It was the time of the Windrush generation was coming across to the UK. My parents was one of, was one of them who thought that, well, great, we'll go to this new country and, and mm -hmm. start to send for our kids one at a time, leaving the kids at home. And my story is the same as many from the Caribbean. Which my dad is the same. Absolutely, and the grandma played a great part because mm. it was the grandmothers that was looking after the children while the parents came to UK mm. and then sent for us one at a time. Uh, and every year I would see, as a 10 year old, I would see um, a suitcase arrive, a brown, you know, remember those brown suitcases <laughs> arrive. Um, and then I, I kind of kind of gathered something was happening. But I was a bit young, didn't realize that, you know, everybody was leaving even me as the youngest. And then um, I got to realize that when I saw that suitcase and I saw my grandma in tears, I realized that one of us, one of my brothers and sisters was about to leave. And it went on for many years while six, so six family, of us- yeah, So your family were getting separated? Get, getting separated, um, one at a time every year. Until finally I came up from play one day and saw the same scenario, brown suitcase, grandma in tears, and didn't really, cocked on what was happening that it was finally my turn mm. to leave this beautiful woman that was everything to me because at the time I was she was like your mom she was like my mom dad the cat the dog and everything <laughs> in one um, because at the youngest of the family I didn't really know my parents when they left oh wow um, I think I was probably about four or five when, when my mom and dad left to come to the UK so grandma was everything until the age of 10 mm. so really everything that I knew then was from this beautiful woman that was teaching me about food and about the stuff that mm. she cooked and you know and these great relishes that she did which now we call sauces but back in those days it was mm. these great relishes that she used to do so yeah grew up in clarendon beautiful part of part of jamaica and having this lovely woman as my guardian to look after me but when finally my time came and i had to you know rip myself away from her and and come and join my family in in, in england that was when the problem started. Yeah. Is that when the nightmare really started from this beautiful place wow. in Clarendon? So what was the nightmare? What, was, what happened? Well, it was being ripped from my grandma for one, and as a child, you don't have a choice then whether or not you know you want to leave that scenario. You know, you're ten. You're, you you do what your parents tell you to do. If I had if I had a choice, then I would have remained back there because I'd never faced things like racism and stuff like that. And instantly when I arrived back then in the 70s, that was one of the, the massive things that was against black people back Just then. Just to go on that 70s. point, because my dad said this to me before, my dad's from St. Lucia, but similar to Jamaica in that sense, that colour wasn't an issue when he lived in St. Lucia. Yeah. And it was only an issue in his life when he came to the UK. Yeah. How do you deal with that, with that type of thing as a kid? Well, I, I appreciate what you've just said because the thing is, I had a, a, a white person in my family mm. when we lived in Jamaica as a child, but I never really noticed that. I never yeah. really understood. So you're you taught racism, that. though, and it shows you that you're taught racism. Yeah, yeah. It's only when I come here I realize that that was, you know, there were mm. such things as racism. But I lived with Mr. Butler all my life. He was a part of my family, and he was white. But we didn't take that as an issue. But it's when I eventually come to the UK and you realize that you're coming home from school. And if you turn right, you meet these lovely white kids who wanted to know about the reggae music and know you and about the food and mm. everything, and it was fantastic. But when you turn left, you meet the other kind of the whites. It was like the fascist whites, you know. Mm. These kids over here were the, the fashion white kids that loved the black fashion. Mm. You turn left, yeah, you turn left, and you met the fascist guys, which they wanted to rip your head off. Mm. And in the seventies, then we did a lot of running away from skinheads back back then. Mm. Um, so. Coming over here and having to realize there was such thing as racism as a 10, 11 year old boy and going into school and having to defend yourself, it kind of detracted me and many others away from the curriculum mm. where you had to try and find some kind of identity within this new world, which he wasn't prepared for. 
Mm. In some sort of way, it's not like now children are moving abroad and you see, you see things on the television and you go on the internet. And they're aware, like, they're more aware. They're aware about where mm. you are and stuff. But I think for us back then, it's coming over as Windrush. Windrush children, mm. it was one of the most difficult things in integrating within the system. Mm. As, as that held you in good stead in your later life, that built that resilience and it enabled you to kind of come over many trials and tribulations in your later part of life. Yeah, I, I think in some ways, but I don't celebrate it because mm. I, I've always said that I, I don't believe that what happened to me later on in my life when I met people like Peter Jones, I don't think just meeting a man like him changed me into who I am today. Mm. I was always me. I, I was always capable of doing the things that I'd done later on in my life when you meet somebody that can point you in the right direction. Mm. But like myself, then I do believe that many kids now in my local area of Brixton, where I still live, have the ability like what like I did. But you don't have someone like a Peter Jones or the opportunity opportunity yeah. I had to come around and say, look, I can help you and I can make a few calls and, and, mm. and, and enhance the natural talents that, that you have. So I think if, if I did have that, I, would, if I wouldn't have struggled for many years because I, I didn't realise my dreams until I was in my 40s. Mm. But, but I do believe that if I had the opportunities back then, um, I perhaps would have excelled a little bit earlier. Mm. So when did you find this, like, this knack of being able to cook and this love affair with cooking? Oh, I think it was struggling. It was, it was part of that struggle, Rio. Mm. Um, I, I left school and and thought that music was going to be the key thing for me. Um, mm. For many years it wasn't. Um, and then you spiral down, trying to, you're always trying to search for money. Mm. You know, that was it. You thought, I thought my life could have changed if only I could have got some money, but it, it didn't. <laughs> Actually, what I needed to learn was how to handle the money. Should mm. I be so lucky to get my hands on it? Because that relentless search for it led me into even more trouble. And it was while I was serving a sentence, while I, I got a huge sentence. And I was there and thinking that, well, you can't go any deeper. The only way to go now, to, to go now is up. Mm. And, and to change your life and change from who you are um, and to become someone else is a, is a massive challenge. Mm. Um, and that's what I did, is having to completely make a flip turnaround from the person that went in somebody else that came out. But how, do you have to lean on people for that or is it internal, it's about you? Are you like, drawing on experiences yeah. from the past or what? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think that we all need somebody to make that movement because mm -hmm. it's in you, as I says, growing up in Brixton with the skill of being a hustler and all that. It's all mm -hmm. useful when it comes to being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. But I think it needs somebody to come into your life like a mentor to be able to get the best of you out mm -hmm. because you're good but you're not the best of you. I think that's always takes somebody to come in and to spot that. And I, I had somebody when I was inside, she was a teacher that comes into the prison at the time, to kind of a, a drama teacher and help you know, people to sort their lives out. Mm. And um, she was the one that gave me certain books to read and sort of taught me how to be the better mm. Levi, you know, the, the, the best of me. And is, is listening very carefully to her, mm. which I didn't used to do before. You know, I didn't used to do a lot of listening. <laughs> yeah. um, but being in that situation, it gives you the time to find out who you really are. And I found myself within that situation, and uh, as well as having a mentor to, to guide me and gave me the right books to read and mm. show to you. If you, when you do go out into in, into freedom, you need to be a new person, and this is what it looks like. And and yeah, I managed to. To clock that. So she would be the biggest influence in your life, yeah, you'd say. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That that check that made that change yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah. So so when you like you just want to go back to the point because that's that's something that resonates with me about the wind rush and family coming over. You coming over separately from your family members, uh, siblings, and obviously your mum and dad. How did that affect your relationship with someone like for a dad to be very important and influential in a young uh, man, especially his life. How did that affect that relationship? It, I think it was probably one of the most difficult things for me, as well as dealing with the other stuff like coming to the new world and dealing mm. with racism and all that, was, was, the, was the home life. Because my father was one of these very old school Jamaican dads who, who ruled the house, you know, with, with a rod of iron. Um, and, and I think in some ways that comes through, through slavery back to a lot of parents in those days where the children was always dealt with very harshly. 
And whereas when I came over, I thought that I was going to be met with open arms with my mom and dad, who I hadn't seen for, mm. for eight years since I was a baby. Mm. And my grandmother was always preparing me for that. I, as a matter of fact, I remember the final words when, when she dropped me off at the airport, because I came over on my own at the age of 10. Um, she was telling me how much, you know, my mom and dad are going to love me when I, when I come to UK. My brothers and sisters are going to welcome me with open arms. Mm. Because they were all been here many years before I come over. Mm. But actually, coming over here was the worst thing ever. Because my, my father absolutely hated me. And wow. for, for, for reasons I still cannot fathom. Have you not asked him, Mr. Dad, why are you, why are you like this with me? He's never really explained why his youngest child just, just, just never clicked with him at all. I, I, maybe it's because when I came over, I was very raw. Because I never had any education when I was in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I came over unable to spell my first name. Wow. At the age of 11, and I only had five letters. So that mm -hmm. shows you how bad I was. I was a raw country boy that my father didn't really have time for. Working four or five jobs. And I kind of understood how, how we had to do it in those days, in the Windrush mm -hmm. days. And I see my parents, along with many parents in those days as superheroes. I really do. I mm. see them as, as entrepreneurs because they had to really work hard to be able to do what they did to bring us through as a family. Mm -hmm. uh, but my father didn't take any prisoners when it comes to, to, to showing love to, uh, as a father to a son. So in some ways, it was me trying to level up the score at home as well as dealing with the situation and trying to integrate um, with, with this new society mm. that I found myself in. So it was really difficult. It was really difficult. But I think my mom kind of saw that I was missing my grandma and missing that setup of being Jamaica. And she kind of stepped in. And I think that was being the, my savior, that my mom became a carbon copy of my grandma mm, and, and showed me that love and that attention eventually. Mm. And I think that's how I managed to kind of raise my head above the water from the attacks of my father. Mm. I mean, me and my dad have talked about this type of thing a lot, like how my dad was strict with me when I, when I was young. And then he's become less strict as the years gone by with my sisters who are like 15 odd yeah. years younger than me. Is that how it's been with you? Look, what's been the, the, the differences? Or if you use your dad as a, a benchmark? Yeah, be absolutely, from? absolutely. I, I think I've always said that, you know, my, my father was the devil and my, and my mom was the <laughs> angel. And, 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 and what my father taught me was how not to be the devil. <laughs> That's what I took mm. from him. And what I took from my mom was what a real angel is like. So in, in some ways, my life and how I've turned up with my, with my kids is completely different. Mm. Um, I think especially in my latter part, because you do get better as you, as you, as you get older. More placid. Yeah, more, more placid. Calm. I have a very young son now. He's only 10 now. Whereas my oh, other right. kids have all given me grandchildren and stuff. But I have a 10-year-old now. And how I see him and how that the love flows between us mm. um, is how I perhaps would have wanted my father to, to work with me. Mm. Um, but yeah, now I, I put all that mistakes, which I had a lot of from my father, I now use that as feedback, you know? Mm. And so I, in some ways I can't, I don't rejoice it, but I see some reasoning having all my past, um, whatever it may be. Yeah, you try and um, use the negative as a positive. Use the negative as a positive, positive yeah. So now I, I have an expert, I'm an expert in how not to do it, mm. um, because I've had enough of that. And now I have an absolutely beautiful, I have the best relationship with my, with my young son Christopher as possible because now mm. I know how to do it and actually I also now, or now know how not to do it as well. Mm. Mm. It's important because we are right is madly about love as well and um, inclusion and, and to hear you, when you, it's being humble enough to go, you know what, there were mistakes made, I've made mistakes but I'm going to rectify them yeah. and, and yeah. someone will benefit, i.e. Your, your, your son, which is great to hear. Which is it's an important part because that's on the way to becoming what I said about being the best of you. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be the best of you if you can't be honest about yourself. That is yeah, the first true, thing. Yeah. You have to face who you are and tell yourself the truth. You know, mm -hmm. and be comfortable with them as well, so you you can actually speak about them. Because for years I I couldn't speak about my father. Uh, I think the first time I spoke about my father was actually on um, Desert Island Disc when I did my. my well, that's Desert where Island I was touching disc. on your back. Yeah. I listened to it. It was the first yeah. time that I because the, the interviewer Kirsty she managed to get it out of me in mm. something because she was very good. Because normally as a as a, again as a Rasta man and as a Jamaican child. 
digging deep in those kind of issues is not somewhere where we too like to go mm. um, in, in public. And keeping it in was, was always the way. But I think on that show, when she managed to get me to talk about it, it actually became more like a freedom for me now. Mm. And I, I kind of free up, it, it freed me up talking about these issues as well. No, it's important. I think talking is so huge. I think, like you say, for, for, for men, that machoism, men don't, it's not normal for us to yeah. talk. Like, I, I used to have this with my dad. And I, I never knew where my dad stood on a lot of things because he never, he was a quiet guy, but stern and hard. But now, as he's got older, like you say, it's that ability to learn from what's gone on. Yeah. To yeah. make yourself a better person. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was asked earlier on, what, what, what is love? And I said, love, love is Uggs. And it's the best way I can explain that. Because now, me and my son, we're always hugging each other, mm. which I can't remember ever that my dad ever Shame hugged me, man. you know, whatever <laughs> the feelings were. But that's not a way that he was as a, as, as a man mm. towards his children. So now I flip that switch. And now there's nothing better I love more, mm. more than the hugging. When you boy. walk in the house and oh, you start to get a hug, it's the it's most amazing thing that there is. Yeah. I say love is hugs, man. Because yeah, right, you've got to feel the love. Talking of love, I know, listen, food. That's one of my yeah my loves and one of those one of yours. Just tell us some people who who may not know. I'm sure most everybody knows, but just give us a little insight into how your life changed when you went on to Dragons Den, and these people you met who kind of helped change your fortune as well. Yeah, well, boy, you know the story is real. You know that you read as kids, you know about dragons and stuff and about you know, going, getting the treasure and all that kind of, the dragons are always scary, even in mm. stories, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, 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 and there's always, a, they're always breathing fire and, and you, it's always difficult for you to get the treasure. Mm. So when I heard about this Dragon's Den thing, I was at an exhibition um, in the Shires, because in those days, I actually got driven out of my local Brixton with the sauce because nobody wanted to buy it. They were saying that Levi don't sell us no sauce because we can all make it. Because uh -huh. I made a mistake. I thought that I had a right to a market. When I, we did the sauce in my kitchen with my kids and we thought, okay, great, we live in the Caribbean area. Sell it in our it's going to sell amazingly. Yeah. And we did loads of bottles. We spent everything that we had to create our first batch of sauce. And then we went after and tried and sell it. And bam. Can I just like, this is one of my things I talk about a lot of my friends, yeah? Do you find that you're still sometimes the Caribbean or the black community, we don't embrace each other enough in terms yeah, of to, to, yeah. to build up each other? Yeah. You see with China, Chinese or with Asian or with Indian, even more now with Polish, except they build communities within whatever country you go to, there's an Indian area. There's a Chinese area, etc. Yeah. We don't manage to do that to support yeah. each other. Absolutely. What's and the reason for that? Well, I, I think everything stares back to how we were indoctrinated, Rio. And, and I really believe that that's mm. something. I know people who said this a long time ago in slavery and you don't need to connect everything. But I think it all leads back to how you were indoctrinated as, as a people, as a race. You know, I, I think it's great now that I see my mate from um, Soul Solid Crew is doing the thing called the Black Pound Day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really fantastic thing to do because you're so right. The Black Pound doesn't stay within the black community very long. Mm -hmm. the, 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 every other pound do, the English pound, the white pound, every, every race that has their money, it stays within their community longer. I think what we're trying to say here is that says when we spend, when we get it, when we work hard for our money before we know it, it goes out and it doesn't stay with, within our, within our mm. communities. And I think that really is a, is a, is a problem for mm. us to be able to, you know, to do that. As, and that as pushed people. you then to go on this show? To go on this show. So, well, actually, yes, but people weren't saying that they didn't really want to buy it. It's just that I made a mistake thinking that they should be buying it. Mm. That your market, and it's a lesson for people who are starting out in business in saying that, you don't necessarily have a right to a market because it's your community. Yeah, yeah. Because people were saying to me, look, we make our own sauces. We are all in this Caribbean people in there, so you can't sell us this. Sir. So I knew that I had to go out and find my market. Um, so I went out into the Shires where I, we said that, me and my son, um, Zayon, we said that we're not going to go anywhere selling the sauce unless it had Shire at the end of the, mm -hmm. of the word. Mm -hmm. And for two years, we went into the Shires selling the sauce and we really found out that 
that people wanted this. It's a mainstream market. I, I got to know that I shouldn't be looking at a, a niche market of just Caribbean people. I should be looking at the bigger picture. So, and, and it's while I was there doing my stuff that I was spotted by a producer from the den who saw me with the guitar mm -hmm. singing, singing the song. Which got you a mobile award as well, by the way. Absolutely, yeah. Um, which is fantastic, mm, you know, yeah. again, because the music is the key thing for me. But that, that, that show, really going on the show is really what made that made me because mm. again it's about being you being yourself because everybody said to me don't don't take the guitar on the show mm. don't sing that i should go as i was always been done and and i said look i want to be me mm. i don't want to pretend to be this guy who knows his maths and knows his numbers and think he's brilliant at business mm. i want to go as the jedlocks raster man from brixton <laughs> that sings a bit cooks a bit but he's really good at being himself. And I, I want the dragons to invest in me and not within the sauce. That's strong to, have to stand tall when you're going on a show that you know could change your life and you're being told by somebody who you see as experienced and knows that world to do one thing, but you stand strong and go, no, 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 yeah. this is what I'm gonna yeah. be. But because I, I knew that I'm good at being me mm. and, and, I, and I rejoiced at being me, which is what I said, which is what my first mentor had said be you, don't pretend to be anybody else. It's easier when you're you. You mm -hmm. play that role better than, than pretending to be someone else. And so I, I went as me. Um, I took the guitar on the show. Nobody had ever sang on Dragons then before. And um, the, the Dragons brought into it. Um, Peter Jones you know, became my mentor after that. And I think it was him coming on board that really brought that mentorship to me where business is concerned. Because um, my own natural flair and everything from being a, an hustle, artist hustle and everything, and the hustler sure. brought me to the business. But I think it's always about what you do after that. Because mm. it is about the long-term thinking. So finding your utopia or, or getting the, slaying the dragons and getting your golden fleece doesn't mean it ends there. Mm. Actually, the journey actually only begins later on because it is about long term, particularly when you're talking about business. How quick then did you go from that show then to getting in shops and oh. having books and <laughs> being everywhere? You go into any kind of yeah. shopping out. Yeah, the, the, it, it, it was the fastest selling product in Sainsbury's. Wow. I, I'd, I'd done the feat of getting a phone call from Justin King uh, just weeks after the, the the sauce was in Sainsbury's, Justin King is is the chief was the chief of Sainsbury's okay. at the time, second biggest store in the UK, um, and they called me up and said to me that Levi, your sauce is outselling Heinz tomato ketchup. Wow. <laughs> My, my answer was, are you allowed to do that? Are you allowed to be a black raster man from Brixton? <laughs> and your sauce is out selling the number one selling sauce mm. in, in the world. So how do you do with that? How do you, how's your head compute that and like stay normal, stay sane? Or did you have a moment where you kind of flew off for a little bit and with, the, with the fairies? I don't know if anybody noticed that I did flew off there, but for me personally, I, I, I think that my musical background is the only thing that kept me grounded throughout all this mm. because the fames came so quick it was it was fantastic in those early days just after and the you show. can't just walk anywhere look how unique looking you look the, yeah. the dreads the colors Again, the style it, the it is about where you where you're from mm. where you are now and where you're going is all about where you're from mm. and i think i i learned how to be this levi roots from a very early day even before dragons then i think my rastafarianism my, my way of life is helped me to be able to channel yourself in a different way that if you didn't have some kind of practice. If you're just a loose guy that don't have no religion or no creed of life or, or anything, you become very open to attacks and from people giving you things and you believing in things and that sort of mm. stuff. But I think when you have a clear function of something, it doesn't have to be religious. It could be just, I don't know, you, you, you like doing something and you, you stick very close to that. Um, like with you and, and sports has been your life, and there's nothing to you mm -hmm. is more important to that. When I was growing up, because of the problems, you had to have something else in your head and it, it was being a rasta mm -hmm. that being able to straighten me out, to have something else to hold on to. And I think when I was discovered in Dragons then and that fame came, whereas you could instantly also be shot down by what Shakespeare says is the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. 
because what he was saying then when you get the outrageous fortune people start shooting all kind of arrows well, at you got a target on your back absolutely but you don't get that target if you don't become outrageously famous and and so that is the cost of of, of doing that so for me it, it it was avoiding that and i was so glad that i managed to be able to to, to manipulate myself through without it, those dangers mm. so after all the successes that you've had now with music with the sources what, what brings you joy now Boy, everything that I do, I think. I think the key thing is that I, I, we are, I know what I've done on Dragon's Den and I know what it's done to not just me as a business person, because that's mm -hmm. one thing and I rejoice that. But what my appearance on the show and the source, which is now still one of with the most distributed Caribbean product in the whole United Kingdom, wow. that's not for me. That's for the Caribbean community, mm. for them to be able to walk into any store wherever they go into the United Kingdom. Used to get, I used to go to Sainsbury's <laughs> with my mum and dad when I was young on a Friday, and they, they weren't even a Caribbean section. You might have got like, I don't know what used to be, there used to be a hot sauce, and Kona hot sauce yeah. maybe, just yeah. in, on one top of the one shelf yeah, in yeah. the corner. <laughs> that, that was it, it was really. It. Yeah, it was it. Yeah. Now you've got, yeah. like, you got a whole area for yeah, yourself. A whole range, which is, is, is brilliant. And I said, that's what makes me feel so proud, you know, out, out of everything, not the personal stuff, is that people of, of Caribbean um, are now very proud that, you know, something for them, as I said, wherever you walk, there's a Liverpool's product. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in the deepest part of, in Scotland, I went to a place called the Mall of Kintyre, which is where Paul McCartney said about one of the most remotest places in Scotland, that you have to take a plane and a boat and a ship and everything <laughs> to get there. And I, I went there to do a bit of filming and lo and behold, I, I saw my sources within, within the store. And again, that That's makes pride, me feel it? a sense of, of, of pride. So I think knowing that you're doing something not just for you, is, is, is for the community or for, for the people. I think you've got to feel proud about that. And I think that's mm. my, my proudest feeling that that's happening. That's a lovely way to finish. I've got a couple of quick fire questions for you before yeah. I let you leave. Yeah, little, lighten it up a little bit for you. So, leave our roots, best meal. Anything that my mum cooks, absolutely anything that she cooks. She passed away a few years ago, so I'm, I don't have the chance to be eating those flavours again. Mm -hmm. But what I am now doing is replicating all her recipes. Because oh, everything that I've done over the years has always been about my grandma. Mm -hmm. You know, the sauce and everything. I talk a lot about her. But my mum was a huge influence in my life and her food is so special. So now mm -hmm. I'm replicating stuff from her. If you had to pick one of her dishes? Her chicken soup. Because all the time I'm here and I used to come home and not feeling too well from tour when I was, music was the main thing for me and I would come home from tour sometime and just feeling really essed out. Mm -hmm. and, and I would go and see mum and she would put on this chicken soup and tell me to just sit mm -hmm. down and while it's cooking, she'll be telling me about old time, about my grandma and, mm -hmm. and all the past stuff that she loved to talk to. Well, that chicken soup always fixed me. <laughs> always fixed me. But every time I try to do it like her, real, no, it on. never comes back the same way. There's, something, trying, in it. there's something in there yeah. that you just, there's a one ingredient you're missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. for real. <laughs> what's, your, what's the last meal you had? Oh, well, at the moment now, I'm only having one meal a day and I've been doing that now for about five years. Is it? Um, Why? Yeah, just, well, it's, it's a way of cleansing out the body. Um, and, and I always say that you are what you eat. I don't go to the gym. I haven't been to the gym for about 30 you years. You look fit, man. Yeah, never been to the gym. I do a bit of yoga inside. I have a yoga mat inside and I make sure that I eat really well so now i'm actually doing a vegan book my, my first vegan book wow. so for the past jamaican vegan book jamaican vegan book nice. so the past eight months or so everything i've been really doing is more based on vegan so yesterday my last meal i had was kalaloo which like is kalaloo. the jamaican yeah. version of spinach yeah. um of it. so i had a kalaloo pie yesterday with cheese in there mm. yeah vegan oh. cheese okay nice and the last one breakfast of champions oh i never have breakfast again because of this one meal a day in the mornings i just normally just like drink a hot maybe some syrup or maybe a coffee sometimes mm -hmm. but never until about one o'clock 12 31 before i start to eat but if i was gonna have breakfast it would have to be porridge man i'm sure <laughs> you know the porridge that That's i'm talking strong, about yeah. yeah not not the, no, english, not the english, porridge, no, no, english porridge not the english porridge the caribbean yeah, porridge yeah. where you can have it either cornmeal or oats or banana banana porridge or planting porridge that's how you, that's or, how, that's or how you peanut get strong. porridge yeah that's how you get strong so um now listen i really love seeing you appreciate it